Evelyn Zumaya rates Affairs Valentino. I am Evelyn Zumaya, the author of Affairs Valentino, and I want to read my book to you. In this installment, we begin on page 16, chapter 1, Skeletons in the Closet. Nine years earlier, Long Island, New York. Some people believe in fate. Taxi cab driver James Donner did not. Consequently, he would later attribute the events of August 5, 1917 to nothing more than his own rotten luck. During the summer of 1917, Donner was employed by the James Hamilton Garage in Roslyn, New York. It was just after 8 o'clock on that fateful Friday night when the garage dispatcher answered the telephone call from Mrs. Blanca Elena de Sals. Despite the woman's heavy Spanish accent, the dispatcher managed to jot down her information. The crossways on the Rosalind Estates would be the pickup. Mrs. de Sals requested that she be driven to her ex-husband's summer home on Whale Neck Avenue, located in the Meadowbrook section of Westbury. The dispatcher handed the information on to driver James Donner. Mistakenly believing this call to be nothing out of the ordinary, the unsuspecting cabbie drove off into the night towards the Rosalind Estates. Upon his arrival at the prestigious crossways, Donner was surprised to see his two passengers waiting for him by the estate's gatehouse. A striking young woman wearing a long, thin white sweater, Mrs. Blanca de Sals, and her maid, Suzanne Moreau, rushed towards the cab and wasted no time sliding into the back seat. Mrs. de Sals leaned forward to give Donner his instructions. Drive as fast as possible, because I must arrive before my ex-husband returns from the Meadowbrook Club. Donner would later recall in his statement to the police that Mrs. de Sals was in a highly agitated state and chattered incessantly throughout the entire drive. He nodded politely as she continued with her far too much information. She went on how she had just spoken with her ex-husband's cook and how he assured her that the master of the house would not return for some time. She told Donner several times how the cook explained that her little son Jackie was already sound asleep for the night. The cabbie's feigned interest prompted Blanca to launch into lengthier explanation of how her ex-husband was violating a court order which required him to return the child to her days earlier. Maid Suzanne Moreau attempted to calm the distraught mother while Donner responded by pressing on the gas pedal. As Blanca laid out every last detail of her plot to snatch her child before her ex-husband returned from his club, her captive audience remained unaware just how determined she truly was. They had no idea she was armed and dangerous. The moment James Donner rolled a cab to a stop in front of Jack DeSalle's Whale Neck Avenue home, he realized his frantic passenger's grand plan had already failed. Despite Blanca's fierce belief that her ex-husband would not be home until later that evening, the six-foot-tall, athletically-built Jack DeSalles stood on his front porch glaring at the arriving cab. The specter of a contentious face-to-face -face confrontation did nothing to dampen Blanca's resolve to rescue her baby boy. She ordered her maid Suzanne to accompany her, stepped out of the cab, and began marching straight down the walkway. Jack DeSalles greeted his ex-wife's sudden appearance by crossing his arms over his chest. Blanca had barely reached the porch steps when she made her demand that he immediately surrender little Jackie. You have told me again and again you would return my boy. I will not leave without him. Maid Suzanne was clearly intimidated by Jack DeSalle's unexpected presence and ignored her mistress's order to stay close. While she hovered a few feet from the cab, James Donner eyed the scenario unfolding on the porch and fidgeted with a steering wheel. Jack DeSalle's diminutive ex-wife stepped up onto the porch as he bellowed down at her. You will never see little Jackie again. When he repeated his threat in an even louder voice, Blanca DeSalle's world went red. Before Cabbie Donner or Maid Suzanne could make the slightest move to intervene, she pulled a revolver from the pocket of her white cashmere sweater and took aim. 
Jack DeSalle's had exactly one split second to register a reaction before Blanca lunged forward, shouting, There is nothing left for me to do. She then pulled the trigger five times in rapid succession. Her first two shots tore into Jack DeSalle's right bicep, and a third ripped deep into his chest. As he turned to grasp for the screen door, Blanca fired two final bullets into the small of his back. He lurched forward and managed a few faltering steps before toppling face first and unconscious onto an old and faded couch. As Maid Suzanne and Cabby Donner began to comprehend what they had just witnessed, Blanca made a fast move to retrieve her son. But as soon as she opened the screen door, she heard the voice of Jack DeSalle's cook telephoning the police. She set the revolver down on the foyer floor next to the hat rack, shut the screen door, and pulled her sweater tightly across her chest. Flashing a quick glance at her ex-husband's bloodied body, she hurried down the front walkway, grabbed her dumbstruck maid by the arm, and pulled her into the darkness of the yard while muttering over and over, I will not leave without my little Jackie. I will not leave without my little Jackie. Cabby James Donner bolted from his cab and rushed to Jack DeSalle's side. While a few miles away at the Nassau County Police Station, the front desk officer answered the cook's hysterical telephone call. Upon hearing the news that Jack DeSalle's had just been shot, he dispatched two police officers and a crime scene photographer to the residence. They arrived just in time to see the blood-soaked and unconscious victim of the crime being lifted by stretcher into a waiting ambulance. While the police officers converged onto the crime scene, Blanca and Suzanne cowered in a row of hedges on the rear of the property. The two women peered through the branches and watched the cops recover the revolver from the foyer, and the police photographer heft his heavy autograph-lex camera just high enough to capture a shot of the entire length of the bloody couch. Blanca crouched lower into the shrubbery as Deputy Sheriff Thorne prowled the yard in search of a perpetrator. It was only a few heart-stopping minutes before he came upon the two women, and to his surprise, one of them confessed to the crime immediately. I killed him, and I'm glad I did. He refused to give me my child, although he was ordered by the court to do so on the 1st of July. He refused again and again, since then, to let me have my boy. Upon hearing Blanca's confession, Deputy Thorne latched a pair of handcuffs on her delicate wrists and thought it odd she seemed so resigned to her fate. The maid, on the other hand, sobbed uncontrollably when she was taken into custody as a material witness to the crime. The two women were then whisked by squad car to the Nassau County Police Station, where less than an hour after the shooting, Jack DeSalle's ex-wife was informed he had just died from his injuries. The police officers on duty that balmy summer night found it difficult to believe that this winsome and sophisticated young beauty had just murdered the father of her only child in full view of several eyewitnesses. Even Sheriff Phineas Seaman found it impossible to reconcile the grisly crime scene with the alluring woman in the white cashmere sweater being booked on Murder One. Blanca de Sales had been in lockup for less than an hour when she summoned Sheriff Seaman, demanding she be allowed to make a personal phone call. He obliged and permitted her to place a single call. She was overheard speaking for a few minutes with an unidentified man saying, I have just shot Jack. I'm in jail in Mineola. It was over the child. Sheriff Seaman could hear Blanca's mystery man on the other end of the phone line repeating, Oh my God, my God. Jack DeSalle's murder inspired sensational headlines, and every local newspaper carried the story front and center the following morning. New Yorkers seeking refuge from the city's humidity uh, in the comfort of their Long Island summer homes awoke to the shocking news that one of their high-society neighbors had been gunned down in his own home the previous night. While they read every last juicy detail, Blanca de Sol sobbed in the arms of her defense attorney, Henry Uterhart, as she related her version of the past evening's horrific events. 
She recalled the details of the taxicab ride with her maid from her home to her ex-husband's summer home and wept hysterically as she told the attorney how she and Jack DeSalles fought continually over his visitation violations. Mr. Uderhart, she said, I only took the gun last night as protection on the dark road. She continued with her explanation, saying her sole intention had been to retrieve her four-year-old son, John Jr., little Jackie. She insisted that she urge the cab driver to hurry because she wanted to arrive at her ex-husband's residence before he returned from the Meadowbrook Club later that night. She tearfully continued by saying that by the time the cab arrived a little before 10 in the evening, Jack was already home. Blanca dabbed her eyes as she recounted the gory details of the confrontation on the porch. He told me I would never see my son again, not now and not ever. It was then she said that she reached for the revolver hidden in the pocket of her sweater. The rest was a matter of police record. At this point, Blanca informed her attorney that she was too ill to continue and that she could think of nothing else but the last time she saw her baby boy as he played happily with his toy boats in his bath. Attorney Uderhart could clearly see that his client was distraught over the whereabouts of her son. He consoled her with assurances that he would immediately look into the matter and began gathering his notes. Sliding the papers into his briefcase, he nodded to the guard at the cell door, letting him know he was ready to leave. Blanca was so emotionally distraught that Henry Uderhart decided it was not in her best interest to inform her that the probability of building a winning defense for her would be nearly impossible. Instead, he concluded his interview that morning knowing full well that her very life depended upon his ability to portray her as an innocent and victimized mother. To do so, it would be imperative that he shield any sordid details of her divorce the previous summer from the prying eyes of the local press. Henry Uderhart's legal mind raced as he stepped out of Blanca's cell and strode down the long corridors of the Nassau County Courthouse. He knew that Jack and Blanca de Salle's divorce had been last summer's high-profile scandal, and that most of the furor involved the couple's extramarital affairs. Truthfully, Henry Uterhart had no idea how he would prevent the reports of Blanca's own love affair from resurfacing. The fact that her alleged lover, had been an Italian cabaret dancer, made the task before him all the more daunting. Henry Uterhart's legal predicament could scarcely have occurred at a worse time. Cabaret dancers, especially Italian cabaret dancers, were being perceived by most New Yorkers as unsavory characters. An outspoken segment of the city's population, uh, they were specifically targeting the dancers' lifestyles and ethnic origins, and newspapers regularly printed such headlines as afternoon dances develop a new kind of parasite whose victims are the unguarded daughters of the rich, and cabaret dancers, the new villains on Broadway. Exacerbating an already volatile situation, New York's district attorney publicly alleged that the tools of the cabaret dancers' trade were cocaine and heroin. Vice squads were busy raiding even the more reputable tango clubs, and along the streets of New York, cabaret dancers were fair game for many an irate boyfriend, father, husband, or brother. Ardent critics of these cabaret dancers were horrified to discover their own wives and daughters sliding across the dance floors of New York's tango parlors in the arms of dancers who were primarily dark-skinned foreigners. They considered even minimal contact between the flirtatious dancers, most often Mexican, Argentine, and Italian, and their predominantly wealthy white female clientele to be nothing short of scandalous behavior. Unfortunately for attorney Henry Uderhart, Blanca de Sales engaged in a blatant extramarital affair the previous summer with one of these Italian cabaret jockeys. This particular jockey was noted for his skill dancing the tango, a dance perceived as so outrageous that young women were warned that the, quote, backward bending and the quick dips to the side might even be physically harmful. 
Uderhart also knew that Jack Dussault successfully prevented his ex-wife from protesting his violations of visitation rights by threatening to file a countersuit naming her dancing partner as co-respondent. Now, Uderhart knew only too well that if Blanca's Italian tango dancing lover could be subpoenaed during her murder trial, his appearance in the courtroom would seal her fate. With this in mind, the attorney resolved to make his first order of business on Blanca's behalf to have a word with her favorite dancer. Feeling the weight of the dire task before him, Henry Uderhart took a deep breath and stepped through the front doors of the Nassau County Courthouse. There, he was mobbed by reporters shouting in his direction. Was Blanca de Salles being threatened by a counter-divorce suit naming Rudolfo Guglielmi as correspondent? Will the Italian cabaret dancer be subpoenaed in the murder trial? The attorney lowered his head, braced himself, and issued a terse no comment. By the time Blanca de Salles murdered her ex-husband in the summer of 1917, she had known the tango dancing Rudolfo for two years. They first met at a benefit supporting French invalids of the First World War. The benefit was organized by Blanca's sister-in-law, Caroline de Salles. Caroline spared no expense, hired a full orchestra, and festooned a ballroom with French and American flags. On the night of the gala event, the ballroom was teeming with wealthy dowagers and token war victims, all hobbling about as Caroline de Salles' guests of honor. The orchestra inspired sufficient patriotic sentiment by playing stirring ditties while local celebrities mingled among the esteemed guests to flatter them into writing hefty checks. One of these local celebrities was a popular, strikingly handsome 20-year-old tango dancer from the cabaret club Maxime, Count Rudolfo Guglielmi di Valentina. Fortunately for Count Rudolfo, Carolyn de Salles was not one of those New Yorkers who perceived tango clubs as a blight upon society. She wholeheartedly rejected the pervasive rhetoric extolling the evils of cabaret dancers and happily included Count Rudolfo on her benefits invitation list. Just as she predicted, the young Italian attracted more than his fair share of women and easily beguiled his fawning admirers into giving generously to the worthy cause. None of the benefits attendees were sure Count Rudolfo was in fact a count, or a marquis, as he was sometimes referred to, but as Club Maxime's most sought-after dance instructor, he was unquestionably the most popular guest at Caroline's war benefit. His every word and slightest gesture had women blushing, tittering, and commenting upon such things as his perfect white teeth and irresistible fiery gaze. They pointed to a profound scar on his cheek and wondered if the deep wound was inflicted in a gallant duel in the defense of a beloved. While Rudolfo worked the benefit dance floor in the wake of coy smiles, Caroline's sister-in-law, Blanca Elena, was not quite as fickle. She did not immediately succumb to the cabaret dancer's charm and exotic good looks. That evening she was dressed, as she always was, in the latest Parisian fashion. Blanca purchased all of her designer clothing and expensive perfumery in Europe, and consequently when she made her benefit entrance that night she was dripping in style and social position. There were no tawdry ribbons wound around Blanca's chapeau, for she wore nothing but fur trim, ermine, or chinchilla. These details made an instant yet fateful impression on Count Rodolfo. Blanca's reaction to his initial overture was appropriate aloofness. Nevertheless, the dashing Count persisted in his effort, and before long he and the young South American beauty were engaged in casual small talk. He learned she was Chilean and spoke not only Spanish, but English and French as well. Rudolfo spoke passable English, some Spanish, and perfect Italian and French. His French mother had instructed him and his siblings well in her native tongue. During Rudolfo and Blanca's first exchange, he was most grateful to her for having done so. During this conversation, Blanca and Rudolfo discussed art, the opera, and ballet. 
although they did not spend a great deal of time together that evening. Apparently, the popular tango dancer made a reasonable impression upon Jack Desall's wife. For over the course of the next few weeks, she frequently left her little son Jackie with her maid Suzanne to head straight to Club Maxine's for more intimate conversation with the Count. Maxime's tea dances became the perfect opportunity for Blanca to languish in Rudolfo's arms on the dance floor, and before many of those afternoons slipped by, they fell deeply in love. There was one unfortunate hitch to their nascent love affair. Blanca was married to a husband 14 years her senior with a social standing of great renown. Husband Jack was once the captain of his Yale football team, which was considered a notable achievement in New York society at the time. While his wife was carrying on at the Club Maxime, he was working as a partner in his family's prestigious Park Avenue real estate firm of Heckscher and DeSalle's. This influential position garnered Jack DeSalle's powerful allies, including President Woodrow Wilson. Despite these impressive achievements and well-placed friends, Jack's unhappy and wayward wife managed to scheme ample quality time with her Italian lover. As Blanca swayed back and forth across Club Maxime's dance floor in Count Rudolfo's arms, she whispered tearful accounts of her husband's own infidelities to an ever-sympathetic ear. She claimed that on one occasion she discovered Jack in their apartment in a compromising position with a Broadway showgirl. As Rudolfo listened to Blanca's heart-rending tales, he resolved to free the young mother and her little son from this louse of a husband. It would not be long before he devised an ill-fated plan to do so. Carrying on a love affair with Blanca promptly compromised Rudolfo's position as a favorite cabaret dancer at Club Maxime's. His other dancing partners bristled at Blanca's excessive time with their dancer, and Blanca in turn resented every second he spent with anyone else. To remedy the dicey situation, Rudolfo sought some form of employment that did not involve accommodating the attention of a bevy of regular possessive dancing partners. It was not long before he secured a position dancing with acclaimed vaudeville performer Bonnie Glass. This was a respectable promotion for Rodolfo, and he was thrilled to be appearing on stage in her nightclub act at Shea Fisher on 45th Street. As soon as he began his new job, Bonnie Glass married and announced to her new dancing partner that she was quitting the vaudeville circuit. Rodolfo was suddenly unemployed. He remained adamant not to return to the problematic drama of the cabaret dance floor and instead auditioned with another popular danseuse in New York, Joan Sawyer. Sawyer was a well-known dancer who waltzed and foxtrotted her way to such professional acclaim that she once performed for the president at the White House. It was with no hesitation that she gave the handsome Rudolfo the nod and invited him to join her on an upcoming tour of the East Coast vaudeville circuit. Despite the prolonged absences necessitated by his touring with Joan Sawyer, Rudolfo and Blanca continued to nurture their dream that she would one day divorce Jack DeSalle's. However, the young lovers were well aware that New York state law stipulated a single cause for divorce, adultery. Fortunately for Blanca and Rudolfo, Jack DeSalle's commanded an impressive reputation as a philanderer, and they knew it would not be too difficult to catch him in the act. It was then Rudolfo hatched a plan to do just that by ensuring his attractive new employer, Joan Sawyer, was introduced to Jack DeSalle's. True to form, Jack wasted no time luring the dancing diva into bed. In doing so, he was unaware that his new mistress's fresh young dancing partner, Rudolfo, was in fact spending a great deal of quality of time with his wife, Blanca. Joan Sawyer was equally as clueless to her predicament, and on several occasions she naively relied upon Rudolfo to act as her cover while she and Jack met for their afternoon trysts. In remarkably short time, Blanca and Rudolfo gathered sufficient evidence of her husband's wayward ways, and she was able to sue him for divorce, naming Joan Sawyer as co-respondent. Because Rudolfo eyewitnessed Jack DeSalle's illicit liaisons, 
he eagerly awaited his subpoena and the opportunity to deliver blistering testimony on Blanca's behalf in divorce court. In a noble but woefully short-sighted act of chivalry, he prepared to share the necessary evidence to guarantee Blanca's divorce. However, he did not foresee that his testimony would all but destroy his reputation, end his career as a tango dancer in New York, and land him in jail. Contrary to the abject poverty to riches life story that Rudolph Valentino's employers later crafted at the height of his fame for fan magazine publication, the true story of his earliest days in New York City was not quite as incredible. In his widely circulated autobiography, published many years later, he detailed a desperate search for employment, food and shelter, and related how he spent a few nights shivering on a bench in Central Park. As this version of the story goes, he arrived in America as an immigrant of humble origins, where he was beset by destitution and hard luck. It was only by virtue of his hardy self-reliance, grit and pluck, that he eventually triumphed over his overwhelming and dire circumstances. Presenting his story in this Horatio Alger format was a wise move on Valentino's behalf, for the truth might not have elicited quite as much sympathy from his adoring public. When the 18-year-old Rudolfo first arrived in America the end of December 1913, he did not wander the streets, live as a tramp, nor suffer too frightfully long on a park bench in Central Park. Although these familiar anecdotes had a little basis in fact, when he first docked in New York City, he was greeted by his sponsor and wealthy benefactor, Frank Manillo. Manillo awaited his arrival and acted as faithful padrino, or godfather, from the day Ruta Valentino first set foot in America until his dying breath. At the time, it was common practice for Italian families to arrange for a sponsor or padrino to meet their relatives upon their arrival in New York. This person was typically financially well-established in America. Although the term literally translates as godfather, at the turn of the century the word padrino meant simply a sponsor who acted as benefactor, protector, and mentor. When Rudolfo arrived from Italy, Frank Manillo and his brother Ciro were wealthy Italian businessmen who amassed their good fortunes furnishing New York's Italian community with familiar goods shipped directly from the homeland. The Manillo brothers were both graduates of the University of Naples and immigrated to America in 1904, where they opened automobile dealerships in New York, as well as in Boston and imported Italian ceci or chickpeas, olive oil, and other Italian products. Frank Manillo achieved national recognition when he introduced one particular Italian relish, the olive, to East Coast dinner tables. This distinction would earn him the lifelong moniker of the Olive King. Frank Manillo founded the American Olive Company and not only imported and distributed ripe olives throughout the U.S., he also personally designed some of the first machinery used in the relatively new process known as canning. Frank and Ciro Manillo had known Rudolfo Guglielmi di Valentino's family in Italy for many years. Consequently, they were both briefed on the subject of Rudolfo's arrival well in advance. The brothers were not entirely surprised by the circumstances surrounding young Rudolfo's hasty mid-winter departure for America. The cablegram from the Guglielmi family arrived in New York as a formal request, petitioning the Manilo brothers to sponsor Rudolfo upon his arrival and intervene if immigration officials questioned why he was arriving in America instead of the family's firstborn son, Alberto. Although the honor of immigrating to America was usually bestowed upon the eldest son, the Guglielmi family apparently made an exception. As Frank Manillo read the cablegram, he felt particular empathy with Rudolfo's plight. For Frank's position of social respectability in New York City in 1913, belied his many tumultuous years as a youth in Italy, where he caused his well-to-do family no small amount of grief. One of his notorious teenage disappearances triggered a frantic international search by relatives and Manillo family friends. 
Fortunately, the runaway Frank left a warm trail, and his family was stunned to learn just how fast and far the teenager had traveled across the Mediterranean Sea to Africa. They finally found Frank in a remote village where he had taken up housekeeping with a devoted concubine. He was promptly hauled home to Italy, where he then followed the straight and narrow by heading for America with his brother Chiro. By the time Rudolfo arrived in New York, his still youthful godfather, Frank Manillo, was 14 years his senior. Frank was a married man, and he and his wife, Zelinda, were the proud parents of a three-year-old son, Arnold. It would be Frank Manillo who first escorted the wide-eyed Rudolfo on a tour of New York, which included a visit to the Manillo brothers' personal tailor to order a new suit complete with top hat and spats. The fastidious Frank Manillo instructed Rudolfo in the latest styles of men's fashion and impressed upon him that no gentleman would ever be seen in public without a pair of spotless white spats. Despite the physical hardships and those alleged nights spent on benches in Central Park, Frank Manillo was a generous presence in Rudolph Valentino's life from his first day in America. While Rudolfo was carrying on his illicit love affair with Mrs. Blanca de Sales in 1915, Padrino Frank was preparing to leave New York City and relocate all of his business holdings in California. There, he would continue in his position as the majority stockholder in the American Olive Company and purchase a theater, a seafood cannery on Terminal Island in Los Angeles, and establish 11 olive canneries, as well as an Italian plum tomato cannery in California's Central Valley. He planned to receive additional financing for most of these businesses by securing generous loans from the influential president of the Bank of Italy, Amadeo Pietro Giannini, better known as A.P. Giannini. In the days just prior to his departure for the West Coast, Frank was concerned that the 20-year-old Rudolfo would not fare well in his absence. Despite his own youthful indiscretions, Frank was a staunch Catholic and wholeheartedly disapproved of his young friend's infatuation with Jack Dussault's wife. He repeatedly implored Rudolfo to terminate all relations with the married woman and reminded him that such an involvement would only bring more shame upon his good family's name. Frank emphasized his point by reminding Rudolfo of the circumstances surrounding his abrupt departure from Italy. But blinded by his love for Blanca, Rudolfo continued to ignore the sage advice when Frank left for California. It was one year after Frank's departure when Rudolfo and Blanca were anxiously anticipating her day in divorce court. Their attempts at discretion became increasingly feeble, and Blanca often checked into a suite at the Hotel Majestic on Central Park West and 72nd Street under the name of Mrs. John Smythe. On August 17, 1916, Mrs. John Smythe again reserved a suite at the Hotel Majestic, where she planned an intimate celebration with her dear Rudolfo later that evening. That very afternoon, he would at last be taking the witness stand to deliver his testimony on her behalf. Rudolfo was not the only witness to deliver damning testimony against Jack DeSalle's in divorce court that day. Jack's valet provided his own share of tattling on his boss. But it was the sight of the dashing Italian tango dancer ensconced on the witness stand that sent Jack de Sales into a homicidal rage. The brash Count Rudolfo blatantly risked everything, including his job, to publicly incriminate his boss Joan Sawyer and Blanca's husband. The apparent extent of his devotion to Blanca de Sales left little to anyone's imagination. When he was asked if he ever witnessed any liaisons between his employer Joan Sawyer and Jack de Sales, Rudolfo had his answer. Yes, while Joan and I were appearing at Keith's in Washington, she left to travel to New York to see Jack DeSalle's. I accompanied her as far as Times Square the next morning. When I called for her at his apartment, he was standing there in his pajamas, waving to her. When Jack DeSalle's attorney asked, Mr. Guglielmi, doesn't it strike you that you are doing your employer rather a bad turn to come here and give this testimony this way? Rudolfo responded, no, sir, because I have a special reason. 
His open declaration of a special reason was then entered into court record and officially went public. News of Count Rudolfo's revelation flew out of the courtroom and inspired new rumors that whipped up a frenzy of renewed interest in the DeSalle's divorce proceedings. The press responded to the ruckus by cramming the morning editions with lengthy articles about the courtroom's entire cast of colorful characters. The public soon learned that Blanca Elena de Sales was the niece of a former president of Chile and the daughter of Senora Blanca Urasiz Vergara, one of the wealthiest women in Chile. After a privileged childhood in the suburb of Valparaiso on her mother's estate in Vina del Mar, the teenage Blanca fell in love with a much older man, American businessman John Longer de Sales. These news reports revealed one more shocking disclosure. At the time Blanca married Jack de Sales, he was 33 and she was a mere 16. The news reports did not disclose that after their marriage, Blanca and Jack moved to New York City, where she promptly discovered he was an incorrigible philander. For this reason, it was not long after the birth of their son, Jack Jr., that the couple separated. Despite the DeSalle's marital woes, until that day in divorce court, Jack DeSalle's incorrectly assumed that his beautiful wife, Blanca, was oblivious to his many indiscretions. He also believed she was his faithful wife. Consequently, it was not until Count Rudolfo took the witness stand that Jack de Sales realized he had been duped. While he had been carrying on with every beauty on Broadway, including Joan Sawyer, his wife was not only aware of his dalliances, but she was spending long afternoons in the arms of her beloved Italian tango dancer. Although Blanca's divorce was all but guaranteed by Rudolfo's powerful testimony, they were both about to pay a steep price for his courtroom bravado. Rudolfo's euphoric victory lap with Mrs. Smythe in her Hotel Majestic suite was clipped short when a furious Joan Sawyer tossed her dance partner on the nearest curb the day after his appearance on the witness stand. Any pride Rudolfo felt while delivering his testimony quickly dissolved into public disgrace and immediate unemployment. In his desire to free Blanca from her abusive husband, he had sorely underestimated the wrath of Jack de Sales, who exacted his swift retaliation. The precise details of how Rudolfo landed in a holding cell in Manhattan's infamous jail, known as the Tombs, would vanish over the years. The surviving facts of his three-day incarceration reveal a sketchy tale of likely entrapment set in motion by Jack DeSalles and his powerful cronies in New York, a New York where cabaret dancers, even ex-cabaret dancers, were always fair game. On September 5th, Rudolfo visited acquaintances in an apartment on 7th Avenue near Carnegie Hall and answered a knock at the door. Three suited men identified themselves as an assistant district attorney and two police detectives. They arrested Rudolfo on the spot and also took into custody a middle-aged woman, Georgia Tim, who happened to be in the apartment at the time. Although neither Rudolfo nor Georgia Tim were officially charged with any crime, they were both held as material witnesses in the operation of an alleged house of ill repute. Ironically, the district attorney claimed the apartment where their arrest took place was being used to frame unsuspecting visitors. Rudolfo's bail was fixed at an exorbitant $10,000. How and why he came to be visiting this address at that precise moment remains unclear. But the following day, local newspapers carried a cryptic statement revealing that Rudolfo Guglielmi de Valentino was arrested after a certain well-known New York businessman notified the police of his whereabouts. Rudolfo's only recourse to raise the $10,000 bail was to contact Frank Manillo, who was by then 3,000 miles away in California. Convinced that Jack de Sales had masterminded his arrest, Rudolfo could do little else but wait out the situation while locked in a holding tank in Manhattan's tombs. A 
At the time of his arrest, the holding tank in Manhattan's tombs was thick with thieves and wedged with men in every stage of social decrepitude. Rudolfo sat lost in the lot, perspiring heavily and rapidly losing his battle to maintain the press of his white dress shirt. One hooligan eyed his futile efforts and curled his mouth in an exaggerated effort at pronunciation. What kind of name is Rudolfo? Obliging the confrontation, Rudolfo responded with an explanation. It is Rudolfo, Rudolfo Alfonso, Raffaello Pierre Filibert, Guglielmi Valentino Giantanguola. I am the son of a cavalry officer, Giovanni, and my mother Maria Gabrielle is the educated daughter of a French engineer. By then the troll of a man had lost his fleeting interest in his cellmate's name and was shuffling to the opposite side of the holding tank. Rudolfo, proud son of a cavalry officer, was left alone with his thoughts. For a few minutes he left the rancid cell by recollecting his childhood in the small town of his birth, Castellaneta. In this daydream, he was again a little boy, scampering over the sunny hillside olive orchards and playing in the great ravine. He remembered clearly his challenging his playmates with a crudely thrown-together wooden sword and hiding from the villains of his make-believe. Before returning to the bleak reality of the tomb's holding tank, he savored one more memory of another incarceration that took place many years earlier when the King of Italy paraded past his grammar school. He recalled how his teachers were fearful he would pull one of his usual pranks and how they confiscated his clothing and locked him in a room high above the street for the duration of the King's visit. This had only fueled his youthful determination to see the King. Sliding down a rain gutter and ducking into a nearby stable, he salvaged a ragged pair of pants and a jacket used to muck out the horse stalls. After rolling up the pant legs and tying a rope around his waist, he slipped into the crowds in the street, just in time to see the king ride by. The bars of Manhattan tombs would not be so easily breached. With no rain gutters to slither down and no nearby ravine in which to find easy shelter, Rudolfo was forced to spend three long days watching drunks, thieves, and rats come and go. He was racked with guilt and worried that his mother would learn of his predicament. He did not sleep a wink. Consumed with dread, he became increasingly resolved to the sure and impending indignity of deportation and steerage passage on the next ship bound for Italy. On the third day of his imprisonment, Rudolfo was informed that his bail had been reduced to $1,500 and that it had been paid in full. Whether news finally reached Frank Manillo in California or whether Blanca secretly dispatched an envoy with the cash, Rudolfo was again a free man. For a 21-year-old dancer who lived and worked dressed in tails, a top hat, and spats, Rudolfo's three days in the tombs levied grievous injury not only to his pride but to his spiffy wardrobe. If Jack DeSalle's head happened along Center Street in Lower Manhattan on the morning Rudolfo was released from the tombs, he would have had his Yale quarterback reputation taken down a notch by one disheveled and wild-eyed tango dancer. Despite Rudolfo's incarceration, the court granted Blanca her divorce and she and her husband were awarded joint custody of their son, Jackie. Over the course of the next year, the notoriety of her scandalous love affair eventually waned, but during this time, Jack waged an unrelenting campaign to eliminate Blanca from his son's life. He threatened again to file a counter-divorce suit against her publicly naming Rudolfo as correspondent. As Jack continued to violate his court-ordered five-months-per-year custody of his son, the tensions between the two parents mounted. Consequently, Blanca could scarcely risk engaging in any behavior which might cost her custody of little Jackie, and she was forced to choose between her son and her lover. By the spring of 1917, Jack DeSalles was exploiting every opportunity to buy favor with his four-year-old son Jackie. He plied the child with candy and expensive toys while continually making derogatory remarks about his mother. Embroiled in this daily strife, 
Blanca's feelings for Rudolfo diminished, and it was not long before he realized the unwelcome and painful turn of events. Although the DeSalle's divorce was no longer news, this did not alter the fact that in a socially conscious New York City, Rudolfo Guglielmi di Valentina had worn out his welcome. He'd narrowly escaped deportation, and his association with the DeSalle's divorce and subsequent arrest left him drifting dangerously towards the status of social pariah. In his generous Padrino Frank Manillo's absence, he scrounged part-time work as a five-dollar-a-day extra in a few movies, and as a diversion he paid for a few flying lessons at an airfield in Mineola, Long Island. Perhaps the location of the flying school was more of a motivation than any sincere love of aviation. Blanca de Sol's summer home on the Roslyn Estates was located only a few miles from the Long Island airfield. It was about this time that Rudolfo befriended an aspiring actor, Norman Carey. Handsome, dashing, and athletic, Norman Carey had just recently moved to New York City from his hometown of Rochester in upstate New York. Carey was born into affluence, which ensured that his every endeavor would be supported by his well-to-do family. Rudolfo was not quite as fortunate, and with the exception of asking Frank Manillo for support, he was financially on his own. Jobs were scarce, and he was growing impatient for his successful career in America to manifest. Adding to his frustration, Blanca grew increasingly distant. With Godfather Frank Manillo sending glowing reports of the golden opportunities in California to his troubled godson, it was not long before Rudolfo assessed his impossible situation, said his goodbyes, and headed west. After becoming the movie star known as Rudolph Valentino, all hints of his past indiscretions were meticulously eradicated from his life story. Consequently, the details of his life, from the time of his incarceration in the tombs in the fall of 1916, to his sudden departure from New York and appearance on the West Coast, are a jumble of conflicting dates, flimsy alibis, and studio whitewash. It has been reported he auditioned for the traveling road show The Masked Model, and that he left New York employed by this vaudeville review. Although a photograph was taken in New York where he appears to be included in the cast, his actual departure via The Masked Model is hard to verify. For by the time the show opened in San Francisco, Rudolfo Valentino was not listed as a member of the cast. A draft registration form confirms he was in San Francisco by June 1, 1917. Whatever the actual date of his arrival, one fact is certain. Rudolfo Valentino was never as much headed towards California as he was far away from New York. One fact is certain. Because Frank Manillo happened to be living in San Francisco, Rudolfo made that city his first destination. Blanca de Sales did not fare well mentally in the wake of his departure that summer, and his leaving may have contributed in some measure to her breakdown. On August 5th, the unthinkable occurred when she shot and killed Jack de Sales. It was not long after hearing the news that Rudolfo received the request from her attorney, Henry Uderhart, imploring him to keep as many miles between himself and Blanca's impending murder trial as possible. Rudolfo realized he had no alternative but to heed the attorney's words. He understood Uderhart's concerns and knew if the prosecution were able to subpoena him into court, his testimony could literally kill Blanca by impugning her reputation as a devoted mother. Uderhart emphatically made his point. You will not contact Blanca or make any attempt to do so, or you will condemn her to the electric chair. Despite the undisputed fact that Blanca murdered Jack DeSalles in full view of several eyewitnesses, on December 5, 1917, she was granted an acquittal, found innocent on all charges, and granted full custody of her son. Blanca rejoiced at the good news with her mother, who sailed from Chile to be by her daughter's side. Blanca's defense was justifiable homicide as a result of Jack DeSalle's outrageous insult, the insult being his refusal to return her child 
and his statement that she would never be allowed to see her child again. Two contrary portraits of Blanca were presented in the courtroom during the trial. The prosecution detailed accounts of her regularly, quote, dancing her heels off and her, quote, snobbishness, and alleged that she was a frivolous, spoiled young woman with a penchant for gay parties, expensive clothes, and the company of one notorious Italian cabaret dancer. The prosecution's inability to subpoena the cabaret dancer was a severe blow to their case, as his presence in the courtroom would have cast Blanca in a much less innocent light. For in lieu of her preferred ermine trim, chinchilla collars, and chamois gloves, attorney Henry Uderhardt orchestrated Blanca's courtroom appearances by ensuring she arrived in sweetly bowed gingham dresses with wide white starched collars. The jury was effectively swayed by her image as a wronged and vulnerable young mother. As they filed into the courtroom to hand down their verdict, the foreman gave Blanca a wink and a thumbs up. When the verdict of innocent was read, several jurors rushed from the jury box to hug Blanca, with one juror gushing, We're your friends, little girl. Blanca's loyal jury was careful not to acquit her by reason of insanity, and thereby guaranteed her legal right to retain custody of little Jackie. While Blanca's acquittal was being handed down in New York, America's sweetheart, movie star Mary Pickford, was filming her seventh movie that year, The Little Princess. In this film, she played the part of a young girl reared in India and then sent to London to attend an exclusive boarding school. With much of the story's action taking place in London, the film's director, Marshall Nealon, gave careful consideration to the selection of an appropriate location to recreate these scenes. He decided upon the streets of San Francisco and recruited several local policemen to appear in the film dressed as English bobbies. The filming of the Little Princess's San Francisco location scenes drew crowds of spectators. Consequently, when the English bobbies were not looking in front of the camera, they were marshalling onlookers away from the busy set. On one afternoon, production was delayed as director Nealon positioned the costume police officers for the next scene. While Nealon took his time, the star of the film, Mary Pickford, and her leading man, Norman Carey, sat nearby studying their scripts. It was not uncommon for visitors to meander onto the set, and on most occasions, these guests presented no more than a moment's distraction from the actor's daily grind. However, on that day, one visitor appeared who captured everyone's eager attention, and women especially widened their eyes for a better view. The young man was such a flash of debonair, everyone wondered if the film's screenwriter, Frances Marion, had just written the part of some urbane aristocrat into her screenplay. Rudolfo Valentina's demeanor made quite the impression that day, until he spotted his friend Norman Carey. At that moment, his brilliantly executed illusion of being much older and self-important shattered, and his faultless wardrobe did little to contain his childlike exuberance. He waved in Norman's direction, which prompted Norman to leap from his chair, yelling, Rudolfo, oh man, it's good to see you. Director Nealon's next shot was again delayed, while Norman Carey gave his friend a tour of the set. He introduced him to everyone and did not miss an opportunity to explain the mechanical workings of the cameras, the lights, and the type of film being threaded into the cameras. Rodolfo had worked on a few movie sets in New York, but the cameras on the set of The Little Princess were state-of-the-art, and he was mesmerized by the latest technology. When shooting finally resumed, he sat by and watched attentively as the cameraman began cranking their cameras. The long stares from Rudolfo's spellbound audience of women on this set did not go unnoticed by Norman Carey, and he made a point of telling his friend, Rudolfo, you should get into pictures yourself. Meet me for a drink tonight, and we'll talk about it. Elated at Norman's suggestion, Rudolfo accepted the invitation. He was eager to leave San Francisco and had no single valid reason to remain in the city one more day. Since his arrival on the West Coast, he had pursued several business undertakings, but was still in search of a steady income. 
Frank Manillo often covered his daily expenses, and that standing offer to work in one of Frank's many canneries or in his tractor dealership always loomed in the back of Rudolfo's mind. It was upon Frank's introduction that Rudolfo met with the president of the Bank of Italy, A.P. Giannini, to solicit financial backing for the purchase of a vineyard. Despite Giannini's reputation as an aggressive lender to Italian immigrants, he was not impressed by the proposal and refused Rudolfo's request for the loan. With his fleeting dream of owning his own vineyard dashed, Rudolfo registered for the draft and attempted to enlist in the war effort. Due to his poor vision, he was refused at every turn. While he floundered for direction, he resorted to teaching dance at a small dance studio and secured a few weeks' work as a chorister in the musical Nobody Home. He considered none of these ventures to be career milestones. His visit to the set of The Little Princess and Norman Carey's suggestion that he have a go at a career in the movies sparked renewed enthusiasm for a future in America. So by the time he met Norman Carey for that drink, Rudolfo needed no further convincing that a career in the movies and a trip south to Hollywood might be the perfect solution to his professional impasse. Norman Carey kept his promise to assist his friend by telephoning Frank Carter, the road manager for L. Jolson's traveling show, The Passing Show. Carey knew that Jolson's production was in its final days of preparation before leaving San Francisco for a run down the California coast to Los Angeles. He persuaded Carter to give his friend from New York a shot, and after a brief audition as a chorister, Rudolfo Valentina joined the passing show's cast. With another loan from Frank Manillo in his pocket, Rudolfo boarded the train for Los Angeles. His shiny new dream of a career in the movies was far from a unique idea at the time, as the lure of instant riches in Hollywood was inspiring hope in even the most world-weary souls. Americans were heading for Los Angeles in droves, and studio entrances were teeming with starving actors and actresses, all equally confident that fame and fortune awaited them on the daily call line for extras. As the train carrying the cast of Al Jolson's passing show steamed south along the California coastline, past Ventura, past Oxnard, nearing Los Angeles, one more bit player was about to hit town. Before he would achieve any more significance than his fellow aspirants jockeying for position in those daily call lines, a few more tumultuous years would pass. Thanks for listening, and my next installment will be Chapter 2, titled Opportunity Knocks on Room A4. I hope you will subscribe to this podcast so you will be notified when the next chapter goes online. As always, you may find your copy of Affairs Valentino on Amazon and all online book-selling venues.